All right, O2 AM, Friday morning. Kevin Caban, good morning to you. Good morning, Adrian. Good morning, Colm. How are you getting on? Kevin, good morning. Adrian, good morning. Again. Colm, good morning. Great to see you. Thanks for jumping on. Uh, yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, how's the snow in Canada? Has it eased since we were on to you two weeks ago? No, I, I actually can't turn the camera. No, we had we had heavy snow in the last week. We had we're probably what um four or five inches at the moment. We are, yeah. Fully everywhere. The the roads are clear. There's no drama when it does snow. That's mm-hmm. the thing, thankfully. But no, we've we've had a we've had a heavy bit of snow. So it's ah, it's it is what it is, you know. It, till the end of March, probably middle of March at least, we'll be uh we'll be we'll be getting a bit more snow, I think, until then. Now, listen, we like to get you on to chat about football every now. Whenever we can get you, Kev, which, you know... Given you ask me about the weather every single time you come on. Do you realise that? Well, I'm trying to find some sort of point of interest to sort of ease our, our uh, viewers yeah. into a conversation with you. That's, that was it. Well, I it's you hardly, a bit more it, giving than like a, sort of a mini weather forecast, to be honest with you. But, well, it's you know. hardly interesting, is it? Let's be honest. Well, it'd be interesting if you made it interesting. But look, at there we go. <laughs> come here. We, we, I'm, I'm, t- turning, I'm turning into you then, Nama. I was tipping around in the car the other night listening to... Um, Tuesday nights off the ball and uh, to my surprise John Malloy introduces a clip from the football pod of Kevin Caban dissecting the um, quality of goal taking in the GEA so we thought well we better give you a platform to expand on this a bit as opposed to just voice notes <laughs> to be a uh, producer so you've yeah. been impressed is that is that the short story? A little bit Um, I mean James Carr is obviously having a great season in terms of goals, isn't he? Certainly in the league, he's, he's scoring one or two crackers. No, but it was something I, I'm sure I've brought it up to you, Adrian, when I was uh, more of a regular, when I was uh, on the show with you guys a lot more, uh, going to a lot of games, watching a lot more games as well. And I always felt that there was a lot of chances, one-on-one positions. I think I think if, I, if I'm looking at it in relation from, from, the, from the GAA Gaelic football to, to soccer, there's a lot more one-on-one chances, I feel, across the course of the game. The game opens up a little bit, certainly in the second half of matches. And I always felt that when players got one-on-one with the keeper, they were always looking to get that clean strike every single time. And you know yourself, when you get the clean strike, the ball is always tends to rise. And I think it gives the keeper the chance. It doesn't have to be, you know, it could be actually a great strike, but the keeper doesn't have to do anything special, I feel, to make the save. And I was always on to Tommy and I was always on to, to you. I'd say, look, is there any ever a way where the lads, look, think about it a little bit more and, and I mean that might be a bit harsh saying you think about it a bit more but in terms of coaching one-on-one positions with the with the with the goalkeeper is there a chance of almost trying to allow the ball where it's very close to hitting the deck and then hitting it hitting it along the floor or, or getting your knee over it to hit it down into the ground so the keeper's got less of a chance to make that save and I, I always felt that that was the case and I, I just I was saying, speaking to Tommy in relation to that James Carr goal at the weekend. Brilliant goal in, in, in how it was worked. But what James Carr did, he hit it down into the ground and under the goalkeeper. And I felt there's always a, a chance when you're one-on-one with the goalkeeper in, in Gaelic football to actually get it under the goalkeeper or certainly have more of a, a, a chance to score if you're in that position. I might be talking absolute rubbish, but Tommy put it oh. to the lads anyway. Tommy put it to I the think lads anyway. I do think you've hit on something interesting as a, as a talking point. Like... I come from a culture of take your point, your goals will come. That was the culture. I mean, I I think we're only emerging from that, to be honest, in the last few years, just in terms of the technique of it, right? Like I think, so like the key difference, obviously, between football and GEA, soccer and GEA, let's go with that for the purposes of this conversation, yeah. is that, you know, at in soccer at times, depending on what's going around you, you might have the opportunity to let the ball do a little bit more of the work and get yourself more physically set. Whereas in GEA, you're constantly obviously mm, yes. in charge of the ball at all time. It's maybe harder to physically readjust yourself. I mean, I don't yeah, I, that's all I agree general. with that. No, I know I'd agree with that. And obviously more bodies in general. Um, but I, I, I do feel though that the one, on, the one-on-one chance is more regular in, in Gaelic football than it is in, in soccer. I, that's the way that I would look at it anyway. Um, um, and, and that the was my... Rule is probably... Yeah, probably a little bit of that. Probably, uh, absolutely. And, and teams in general, when they're defending a lead, they'll sit in and camp on in front of the back four, so in front of the 18-yard box. So you're not really going to get that chance, are you? It's only when the game opens up. If a team's chasing, might be a breakaway from a corner or whatever. So it happens, don't get me wrong, but I think it happens more frequently in, in, in Gaelic football. And I, I, it's just when I was obviously at games and when I was watching a, a lot more games, and I, 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 it was just something that kept on at me all the time to say, well, Surely that clean strike that you look for, obviously, and uh, when I'm talking clean strike, sometimes it might be the the side volley where you get clean through. I'm talking like a Lee Keegan special where it would be, you know, the 
strike through the ball, cut across the ball. If you look at Jermo O'Connor's uh, goal at the weekend, um, where he just put his foot through it, just struck it, and it, the ball rolls into the net. And they look great. They're the ones that look great, don't they? They look like great goals. Whereas James Carr's, the finish itself didn't look great, but it was it was obviously, it did the job and it, it, it went into the net. And that was what I always felt when, when watching games. Where I, and I said it, as I said, I said it to, to the lads, where it's, there's got to be a better way when you get one-on-one with a goalkeeper in Gaelic football to finish, I feel, give yourself the chance, unless you're going in one of the corners where you're giving the keeper little chance, where if you don't have time to think, which is what you're saying to me there, when you don't really have that much time to think and you've got a lad that's maybe dragging your shirt and pulling you back, mm-hmm. I think that's the best option then when you're in those positions to actually, I think you can do that. You can actually purposely hit it into the ground when you're under a bit of pressure because you're not necessarily going to be able to open your foot out and, uh, open your foot out and put it in one of the corners. When you're watching um, a Mayo match, Kev, can you spot the soccer players? Um, no, no. I, I've never really thought of it like that, actually, Colin. Um, but you can probably tell technique-wise. I, 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 another thing that I would have always... Um, would have always thought as well with with free taking. I I think at times free taking off off the deck is is easier uh, than free taking out of your hand. I think I think it gives you a, a chance to actually get a better strike on the ball. That was something else that I thought about. But I think if you look at someone like Killian O'Connor, who scored so many goals over the years, uh, obviously I'm referencing all the Mayo players here. I'm not referencing Dean Rock <laughs> or anyone like that, am I? Um, but no, I think someone like him would be. He would be predominantly take his freeze out of his hand, and uh, that to me, obviously, as a soccer player, would be alien to me. But that's something that they've grown up with, so it becomes second nature to those lads with, with, uh, with free taking. But no, in answer to your question, not really, not really. Would you, would that be something that you would look out for? Well, I was more interested if that's something you'd look out for because of your own background that you couldn't help but compare or admire the technique mm. or even just notice. Because I remember when David Bentley, do you remember that a few years ago when he? Came yeah. over to Ireland and played GEA. Did they? Uh, and, do... I don't know. I don't know if you saw it, Kev. But he no, was, I didn't um, see it. I didn't his... see it. But I remember. I remember reading about it. Anyway, I didn't see it though. No. Yeah, his first day of training. Obviously, he just couldn't get over the whole concept of it. Like you know, he just like yeah. everyone's a go- everyone's a goalkeeper basically is the way he saw it. But they were all kind of laughing at his technique because it was just so pure and good. You know, so yeah. he was taking free kicks out of, or freeze out of his hand in a kind of David Beckham or his own intimate style, like and yeah, he was probably doing his we... side foot looking for the clean exactly, strike every exactly, time, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah. Yeah, and like it, it always it, it occurs to me, like you know, from the amateur perspective, that I could definitely see a, a Gaelic footballer who transitioned to soccer or vice versa. Yeah, but just wanting to be all professional. No, I mean, I think when you guys have the Gaelic the Gaelic players on, you would always ask which you, what's your soccer team, and invariably, where they would all you know speaking to lads over the years, someone like Paddy Andrews, or uh, speaking to the you know the O'Connors, they're big Man United fans, and uh, Aidan O'Shea is a big Liverpool fan. You know, you you speak to, a, to to some of the lads, and they would be big soccer fans. They would be they would be regular regularly going over to to England uh, across the season as well to try and watch games. Uh, not male, of course, because they're always you know there to the bitter end of it, so they they wouldn't get the chance to get over and watch games. But you know what I mean. I think in general, I think you would see you would you would speak to a lot of the guys, and and they would always have their favourite soccer team. So I'm sure that they're all playing seven aside. I'm sure that they've all played eleven aside when they're growing up. Another one. Um, would be Philly McMahon. He would have been another one. He's a big Everton fan as well. He would have he would have had trials as a kid uh, over in England. I read his book and he he had trials and he was very close. He would, would have had to make a decision at some stage. And th- there's so many Gaelic football players. Um, David Clifford's another one. He's a big Celtic fan, isn't he? So you look at, you, you speak to the guys or hear about the guys and they all would have played. And I'm sure that a lot of the guys would have played to a great standard themselves. Even if you're, um, the thing that strikes me from all of that is even if you are like a, a student of strikers in soccer or you're a decent soccer player, like from a technique point of view, it's very difficult to, as you're running with the ball, like one of your biggest things is to try and get the ball away from your body, which in soccer, it already is. So your positioning, the ball is already there. Yeah. It's in a perfect position. You can you can hit it when you want. Whereas there, there is that sort of, like I thought you sort of hit the nail on the head a bit earlier when you were talking about like that second, there's somebody around you dragging like the 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 number of things to do as you're running with the ball, mm. including trying to get it away from your body, strikes me straight away as not conducive to always trying to. Mm. It, it might be part of the rationale for trying to blast the ball to the back of the net, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, I I, I would I would think that as well. I and I think there's probably that old adage of 
get a clean strike is the most important thing. I think that's probably something that they probably would have been taught as uh, from a young age, isn't it? And invariably you get the clean strike as the, 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 the goals always look so much better when, when it's a clean strike, isn't it? Um, but I would look at, and it's not even, I'm saying it's not even looking for that. Uh, I, I listened to the pod there with what Paddy and, um, and James were saying on it, where they were saying, you know, sometimes in relation to both soccer and, and GEA, a goal is not always scored in the purest of forms. It, it can be that miss hit that goes into, into corners and it bobbles into the net. But, but the way I would look at it is it's more of a, a purposeful hit into the ground. I don't think in, in generally in, in football, I know they'd spoke about it. I, it rarely ever happens where, where, where players, I know they spoke about Morris taking penalties, hitting it down into the ground, but that's not what I'm saying. I think in general, I think you, you, you want to get that clean strike. I think you can do more with the ball. And if from just in answer to maybe to what you're saying, I think you have more time to think, certainly from free taking, free kicks, penalty taking, if you're looking at that penalty, um, sort of the, getting the clean strike on that as well, if I'm looking at it more as terms with, with that bouncing ball type thing that he would have hit in the past. But I think in general, in soccer, you want to get open your feet and you want to, whether it's a side foot whip, whether it's a, the clean strike that you're looking for, in GAA, you don't necessarily have the luxury of, of that time once you've opened your feet because you know full well that you are being dragged. And my my, my reasoning would be on it on that um, on that one on one with the goalkeeper. Just in in how I'd see it is, I think you've actually got more of a chance to actually hit it into the ground because if you've got someone on, say I've got someone on my right side and I'm trying to use my left foot to get a strike away, I'm holding the guy off or I'm trying to keep the guy away from the ball and then I'm trying to hit get my strike where it's going to be going into the ground almost, you know, and I think, I honestly, I, I think it's probably an easier skill to get a strike off doing that. Personally, I would think that's an easier skill. In, in, it's easier to, score, to, to execute that skill in which, in which sport? In, in GAA, in oh. GAA, because, because you're under pressure, you're not necessarily going to be able to get that clean strike anyway. So it's, it's almost as, as long as your thought process is get my, my knee, get the leg, over the ball, so you're going to hit down on the ball. You're going to hit it into the ground anyway, mm -hmm. you know. And I think, I, I, I think if that's in your mindset when you're working on that constantly, when you, you know, in general, you know, they're, they're absolute machines, aren't they, the lads? So mm -hmm. the way that they train, I think, I think it's something that you can educate your brain to do. Ozil was the uh, mm -hmm. example that Joe rightly brought up on yes. the show the other night. Um, yeah. Yeah. Was the, that was the, the one. It's a great yeah. shout. Great yeah. shout, actually. Yeah, yeah it was. Can't, Ozil, uh, yeah. can't, can't claim ownership of it. Um, but yeah, I do think there's been, I definitely would have noticed, like, for, I think the, the quality of, uh, and we need to talk, about, talk to you about Everton in Canada, and we'll do that now, but I do think the quality of go, uh, goal attempts in GA has improved an awful lot over the last few years. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. agree. I think Donahue's totally. chat with us about the... Um, what Colin Cooper said to him about not trying to blast it, try and place it into the back of the net. Yeah. I I think that sort of stuff. I think the Mulligan goal. I mean, that's mm, over ten years, more than that. Twenty yeah. five is it that far back? Um, probably helps shift the narrative a little bit as well. I do think there is. What um, about Ender Hessian's goal at the weekend? No, did you, oh, did you like that one? The drop. Oh, that was class, oh, eh? Nice. The drop. Beautiful. Keeper's gone. Yeah, that's, that's Shane class. Curran, mind you, made a good point about the keeper not being. That's a, that's a whole other conversation about the keeper not being properly set. Well, well, he committed yeah. him though. He committed him with uh, body language alone, Adrian. Yeah, I thought you'd yeah. appreciate it. Everton are too good to go down. I'm paraphrasing, but that was pretty much what you told us uh, the last time we were on a couple of weeks back. And I mean, did I say that? Get... No, I don't think I said that. I just I said they'd be in trouble, serious trouble if they went down. I don't think they're too good to go down. Never. I don't think I would have said that. You're paraphrasing again. You're actually <laughs> looking for an answer. Yeah, it's poor. Yeah. It's poor. It's yeah. poor. The, uh, You're looking for an answer. I'll, I'll be absolutely yeah. honest. I did go looking for the YouTube track <laughs> about five minutes before we came on air, but then you came on early and I didn't get a chance to cut the yeah. exact quote. So I I appreciate that. Is I think I think Everton, Everton have got a strong squad, but I I think they're in with probably 10 or 12 other Premier League teams that could go down. And I, and that's the way that... That's You're more encouraged, that, I presume, yeah. since uh, Daesh is there and, or no? Um, I was, I, I, I didn't see the, the Arsenal game, actually, the other night. Obviously, bad defeat, heavy defeat. I watched the Leeds game the other week and um, beat, they beat Leeds, obviously, 1-0. Uh, the Seamus Coleman goal. Great goal, by the way, as well. Great goal. Um, and, and he meant Top it. Top player, and he meant it, which it. was great. Yeah. Yeah, great goal. Um, but it was more the fact is it was actually quite a poor game. I thought honestly, I thought Everton were never really in trouble through the through the game. Leeds didn't really offer a, a, an awful lot. I didn't feel, and I felt Everton were comfortable. 
But it all it was almost as if Leeds were actually just trying to get a point from the game, just come away from Goodison with something. Do not lose this game. And that that's ultimately what I, f- I felt cost them. I didn't see Everton really being a side that were, were, were really on the front foot. Um, sorry, my father-in-law's just calling me there. Um, uh, no, I didn't see Everton being a side that were really on the front foot, really a side that was full of confidence. Um, there was a... There was a little bit of negativity coming coming from the from sections of the supporters. You could hear that with one or two mistakes that was being made, and that's understandable given given the position that they're in. I, I'd feel, but um, I, I wasn't. I, I never felt even with winning that game. I thought, oh, this is a. It obviously was a great result, but I never felt, oh, Everton are out of, out of the trouble now. Sean Dyche has really turned it around. They're going to go on now and and beat sides. That's the way that I felt on it anyway. So it's. Um, and the last two results have maybe proved that. I, I I just think Everton are in a serious trouble at the moment. Serious, yeah. serious trouble. I know I know the position says that, but it's. I think a lot of the players are still inhibited. I think there there's nervousness around the, the play when they when they're going forward, and I just hope that's not going to be the thing that's going to come back to haunt them because I don't feel Sean Dice Sean Dice's mantra through management has always been. Solid foundations. Get the get the back four right, or whichever system Everton are going to play going forward. Get the system right, and that's from back to front. That is everybody back behind the ball when they don't have it. Uh, and I just I'm looking at Everton right now, and I just think, where's the goals going to come from? Where's this real creativity uh, spark going to come from? And 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 I'm it's killing me. It is killing me watching them. I have to say that right, right now. But even even defensively as well, Kev, like <clears throat> if you look at the Everton results in Sean Dyche's first game, so that was a great start, 1-0 against Arsenal, who were an absolute yeah. winning all season. Then the Merseyside Derby, they were very poor, 2-0 against Everton. They uh, had the one win against Leeds, which was all Seamus Coleman, of course, great goal. Then very disappointing last two games, last 2-0 at home to Aston Villa and then 4-0 the other night against Arsenal. If you were, weren't paying attention for the last few weeks, you might assume that Frank Lampard is still in charge if you just looked at the results. Has Sean Dyche made a positive difference from what um... you've seen? You know, I I think that's honestly, I think that's you, you couldn't you couldn't say that that's not a fair comment. What you say, I I don't think much has changed. I think they got the the initial spark. I think it was a good performance against Arsenal and a grinding performance. I think it was something that that they didn't necessarily have under Lampard for for a while, where they were able to just to, just to grind out a result, not necessarily playing well or playing great, but get that get the result, get over the line. They proved that against Leeds. I'm, I'm not saying Everton were were, uh, were awful against Leeds. That's not what I'm saying because I think there's there's a lot to be said about getting results when you're not necessarily at the top of your game. And I don't think Everton are going to be at the top of the game really until the end of the season because it's going to be about grinding every single week and, and getting results. That's something that Sean Dyche's sides have, have been used to over the years or used to doing over the years. We've, we've seen his Burnley side get results when they've not necessarily been playing well or not necessarily been expected to get results. And I think that might be the way this season, just get over the line, get the job done. Um, but I wasn't, I mean, as I said, I didn't see the Arsenal game, but I know it was a poor result, obviously, from from seeing it. But you kind of read clips from it or read reports from it, and it was the defending. And that's something that, that as you say, it's the same as how it was a few months ago or, or yeah. A month ago, under, under Lampard, and nothing, nothing much has changed there, and that's going to be a process over a certain amount of time. That's not going to change overnight. Yeah, well, I mean, it's just a gaze mistake for the for Saka's goal. I'm oh, sorry for Martinelli's yeah. goal against Arsenal. It was just he was dawdling. I mean, that's that's one on one for Sean Dyche is just unacceptable. But you know, like if you look through that squad, Kev, they should be better than what they are, shouldn't they? I mean, they have a decent spine. Yeah. Well, that's maybe going back to Adrian's point before when I said the two good to go down, which I didn't say that, but I I said that the squad and, and I, I, I'm i more going to the to the point column on, on what they're actually paying in wages. Obviously, we all know the transfer fees, but Everton's wage bill, as I said many, I've said it a few times now that they, they were they're paying or they're able to compete financially, certainly across the board with Arsenal. They were able to compete, compete financially with, with Spurs over the last six or seven years. That's the way that it's been since Farhad Mashiri uh, went into Everton. Wages, the wage bill at Everton is astronomical. It's and that was led. That's what led to having to sell Richarlison and the financial difficulties that they had last summer, where it was the financial fair play was um, was was a problem for Everton. Everton weren't weren't actually um, adhering to to the to the Premier League rules, and that was that was ultimately what came back to bite them in, in having to sell Richarlison. So, I think overall. 
if you look at what they've spent, and that was where I was going, yes, they absolutely should be in a better position. And the, the calibre of players that they signed, they should be in a better position. But yeah. I've played for teams, Colin We doesn't necessarily transcend. I always think back to the, to the days when I was at Sunderland and everybody said at the time, we're too good to go down. You've got too good a side. And you went down. We went down just due to the fact was that it was a it was a grind when we were when we were playing at the Stadium of Light. It was it, the, the the team struggled playing there. We couldn't get the results because one bad pass went astray in the first five or ten minutes of the game. They felt the groans from the supporters. Me too, and it was difficult. I think for the for the players to get through each ninety minutes playing your normal game because I think we were feeling the heat from the supporters, and I think that's the way it is at Everton right now. Mm. Are you in touch with Seamus Coleman? No, I'm not. I'm not. No, and I see him here and there, but no, I, I haven't seen him in, in, in a while. So no, I've, uh, I'm have i not in contact with him, no. Um, we want to, uh, they've, they've Forrest and Brentford coming up and I mean, they're not uh, they're oh. far from sort of gimme, gimme results at all, but uh, vital. I mean, the thing but... is you look at it though, don't you? you look at it and you think, well, Forrest and Brentford, but Forrest form is, is being excellent. Yeah. Forrest is safe, more or less safe. Now Brentford, are, they're looking right. upwards. They're looking top yeah. half. So, I mean, I, I, realistically, the way things are going for Everton, both those sides, Forest and Brentford, will be favourites for the games. Talk to us about Canada soccer. Um, it's anybody who's paying any sort of a passing uh, attention to it at all is in turmoil at the minute. Um, yeah, men's and women's teams both in dispute with the governing body. Obviously, the women's team are going to play Ireland in Perth in the World Cup on July twenty yeah. sixth. Uh, they're talking about the. Boycott possibly of a of a camp there next month. Uh, they were yeah. on a strike recently, but then uh, Canada Soccer threatened to sue them, so they didn't. And the men's team obviously had you talked about it last year. Their own pay dispute, um, yeah, a, around the World Cup as well with payments there, and uh, all of these things are very familiar to an Irish audience, I'm sure as well. President resigned, I think, in the last few days. Is it nearing yeah. any? He, he certainly talked a great game in his uh, in his resignation notes. Is it nearing a resolution, Kev, or what's the story? Well, he. <laughs> Nick Bontis, who you speak about there, resigned as president of Canada Soccer. Yeah, but he'd, he'd already got his position within CONCACAF. He's vice president now of CONCACAF. Yeah. So he's gone on to, obviously, a paid job. It's an unpaid job. It's a, vol- it's, it's, it's a volunteer's role or a voluntary role, um, president of Canada Soccer, which it shouldn't be. There's no accountability then, is there? I, I, I'd feel you're the head of a federation that's got a huge turnover every year and you have you have to have accountability when you you're dealing with the numbers, the, the financial implications that's going in there. So, both the men and the women, um, women's sides have had issues. Underage sides have had issues. There's been a there's been um, scandals over here as well um, with within uh, the women's game as well in the last ten or fifteen years that that has been highlighted and off the ball as well. Um, there's there's a number of issues around the team, and it's not going to go away. You're asking, what, I think you're asking there with Nick Bontis going. Does it look likely like it's coming to an end? And I can't see it coming to an end. No, there's there's, there's so much to be done. Both the men and the women of I think uh, I think I'm right in saying they have agreed pay parity. So there's going to be the same uh, match fee for both men and women, which is probably being a given now across um, across international um, the international game. It should be there now. It shouldn't even be an issue. But but also they're they're, they're agreeing. Uh, they did agree last summer on the World Cup win bonuses, where they shared each other's win bonuses as well. Which obviously, with the men qualifying for uh, for Qatar, the women were due a, a big pay for a, 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 a big pay a big payment from that as well. Which was the same with the US. The US have got that in place. But there's there's a long way to go. It seems Adrian, a really long way to go. Um, they're on about cutting the budget in terms of preparation for games. Um, the women, obviously, as you say, they've got the World Cup coming up. They play, they play us um, with that. That'll be a huge game. Obviously, a big game for Ireland, given Canada's ranking in world football right now and what they've achieved coming into the, the World Cup. One of the favourites as as Olympic champions. So there's a there's a there's a long way to go, Adrian. There's there's, there's been issues for such a long time. Uh, numerous numerous issues. There's financial uh, issues regarding where money has been filtered to from the game, going back into various. Uh, various uh, avenues. There's there's so much to get into, Adrian, that it'd be so hard for me to really nail down exactly what it is. Mm. But uh, just by Nick Bontis resigning, it, this issue is not going to go away for, for both the men and the women's games, uh, given what the women have achieved as well over the last um, 10 or 15 years. And given the ranking and given how well they're thought of across the game, they they feel they've been mistreated on numerous occasions. And as I said, 
they they probably deserve so much more respect than they've been given by uh, by many people within the game over here. Yeah, I was uh, there. Go on, Colin. Sorry. So I was just going to say, Adrian, like it sounds like the issues have at least been like acknowledged at a basic level, Kev. But for you, is it still being talked about sufficiently enough, or does it need to dominate the agenda more, not just across the sporting news in Canada, but news overall? Well, I think it, it seemed to come to a head before the, the the World Cup, the men's World Cup over in Qatar, column, and that's the way it seemed to be. It looked like the, the, there was some sort of agreement that was coming into place, but that went out the window recently. We saw um, on TV Christine Sinclair, the uh, the women's international record goal scorer uh, of all time. Um, she has come out and she was the one that was publicly slamming Canada soccer. This is what Adrian was talking about before. They, they threatened to strike going into the She Believes Cup. This is still potentially, it could happen down the line. The men uh, went on strike last summer. They missed uh, an international game last summer. You, clearly, there's a lot of issues. And it's not just, everyone thinks it's about a financial issue. You know, obviously, pay parity across both men and women's sides of the game seems to be the, the, the something that everybody's talking about. It's not that. It's actually the money that's going into, as I said, preparation for international games. It seems like the, you know, we're talking in terms of uh, hotels for the players. We're talking about um, kit for the players. You know, it's ringing a bell on so many different levels. So what we've heard coming from from our own organisation over the last ten or fifteen years, isn't it? The the women the women's game is has been treated very very differently from from the men's game, and the men feel they've been mistreated also. So there's there's a Column, there's so many issues. You said yeah. it's been spoken about, and that is a good thing. That's, I think, with the men qualifying for Qatar, first time since 1986, I think they were able to to create a platform for this, for the talking points to come out and really raise serious issues against Canada soccer and how they were doing things. But um, I think there's just by Nick Vontis going away, the, the, it, it almost seems like it's got to be a root and, a root and branch change absolutely across. Uh, across the whole of Canada soccer for, for the players to, to, to actually change the mentality. That's got to be the thing, but also the supporters now, because the supporters are actually starting to realise what has happened. And I go back even to my time playing, Colin, there were so many Canadian players that just didn't want to play for the country. They wouldn't even bother getting on a plane to fly back to play uh, because of the preparation and because of how they felt they were being treated. So this is not now in the last six months of last year, this is historical. This is what's gone on for such a long time. Definitely shades of, uh, I was listening to Emma Byrne on with uh, Graham Hunter, a big podcast recently, and it just reminded me of all that stuff that went on at that time around their own um, dispute, obviously that they had with the association. Uh, there's obviously a possibility as well that this binds the players together in uh, in a big way ahead of the World Cup, which might be a net uh, loss for us, but I think everybody would be... I fancy that. us. I fancy us to take them. I really? fancy us to take them. Yeah. yeah. Big scalp for the uh, Irish girls. Our um, CNBC XZ LR one two seven sending you out. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I'm not covering it at all. I'm doing nothing for it. No, no. But uh, I'd be looking forward to it. Cup too it, it, it. I don't know what, what time. What time? What time would it be? Irish time. Those games. They're going to be early hours here. I think three and four in the morning. I think it's not uh, going to be great for for uh, for watching. Eleven hours ahead. So for a. Seven a.m. 7 a.m., 8 a.m. Yeah, it'll be like early evening. So you yeah. could come on, Kev. Could. could come on with a call. Uh, it's a good idea, Kev. That's not a bad idea at all. No, I do it, miss it, you. It, I do miss it, you from November. I, I do, I, know, I must say. I know, I know, I know. We used to have a good chat before we went We were building evening, something, yeah, and then it was, it, yeah. it, it, it all ended. You know, well, it's, yeah. it's down to the execs and off the ball. Uh, oh, listen, uh, we'll, have a, sep- we'll have to have a separate chat. Yeah. We've been, I've been mm-hmm. waiting You're for, uh, I've been, I've been waiting for the lads to ask me to come on for a long time, but it's almost <laughs> as if, I, anyway, I, I just take it like a pinch of salt. Easily forgotten <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Talk about fake news. Kev, come on. Thanks, million. Thanks very much. Cheers, guys. Thanks, lads. Cheers.